Hey folks, and welcome to What Happens Next in Insurance. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Alison, Vicky, and Sit Andrew, with which we're going to talk about artificial intelligence live from Innovate Finance. So, let me start by asking Sit Andrew, what actually is artificial intelligence? Uh, thank you, Nigel. It was wonderful to be here today. And uh, so artificial intelligence help us to make decisions. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, Nobel laureate, uh, behavioral economist, he mentioned that every organization is a factory of making decisions. For financial institutes, that number is extremely high. Every day they make thousands of decisions. What AI does, it takes the data and it, it creates algorithm that will actually generate predictions, that different insights, so that people can make objective and more evidence-based decision making. So, so we hear about AI or artificial intelligence every day these days, stories of how we use Facebook data and so much more, but in the enterprise world, Vicky, we're now using it everywhere, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, in Salesforce, we've embedded, we've embedded AI into all of our products. It's embedded into the platform. Um, and we're seeing that in sales, in service, in, in all kinds of use cases. Um, but I guess specifically for insurance, what, when we think about what happens next, the kind of useful or interesting use cases I'm seeing are things like automatic classification of cases of claims based on image recognition. So if you've been in a car accident, if you've had um, an incident in your home, rather than having to describe it or necessarily have a... You know, have someone come around to um, to review that and to and to um, estimate on it. A policyholder could take a photo and upload it, and the classifications would be able to automatically give an initial triage of that claim to be able to, you know, and some of those claims might go through straight through processing. So it's around making that whole process a lot more streamlined, a lot simpler, um, reducing the cost for the carrier, reducing the friction for the policyholder. So I think you know that's a really simple use case, but one that's got great potential in in insurance. I think it's great, right? The use cases out there, there they are a many. How many people are actually doing this? Is it all hype? Is it all lip service? Or are we actually seeing people do it yet? Yeah, like uh, uh, what made my 2017 is uh, early January con like, you know, conference in Dubai and the CEO of Lords of London, Inga Bell, she talked about something extraordinary. She said that every company has some urgency, but there is also an inertia. Right, and, and that's phenomenal that all of us, we know that uh, like, you know, we have to do something, we have to apply AI to improve our decision making. But at the same time, every large organization, we have a tremendous amount of technical debt, what economists call sunk cost. Like if we go to a movie and the movie is bad, we still believe that we already paid for it, so we'll finish the movie, we will do not leave it. But the rational decision making is leave the movie theater, do something else in that time. Right, so that's the approach that every large organization need to take, that really review their technology stack as of today, and really take a look forward approach and where AI can help them in their day-to-day -day decision making. And that's pretty much like, you know, what we are observing in early, like, you know, the, the startups like Lemonade and other people are doing. They're really using automated machine learning and autonomous decision making to improve and give customers a better, like, you know, services and products and etc. So I think all the large organizations have to get there. So what they can do, they can, they have to serve their existing market, which oftentimes is very, very big. So if we talk about AIG, AIG serves every single day. AIG pays $150 million in claims. That's huge. So they have to keep doing that, serve the market, but at the same time, they have to innovate. They have to really change their infrastructure to make it more forward-looking. And, and, and that's the challenge that every one of us are facing right now. So, so Alison, how do companies change these things going forward? Is it an easy thing to go and do, or can they actually do it gradually and introduce it into the organization slowly? I think definitely, yes, they can do it gradually. And I think that's one of the things that we were just talking about, about how companies learn to build innovation from within. Um, you have seen some really great partnerships between big insurers and um, you know, insured tech startups um, where they're trying to embrace the change by bringing um, that capability in-house. Um, but also, um, I think that building a culture of innovation within their organizations and encouraging um, um, you know, teams within their companies to be able to have these kind of safe areas where they can develop ideas, where they can innovate and try things out um, and test hypotheses. Um, and once they've found what works and, and to iterate on that slowly and steadily and gradually and not create behemoth programs that cost millions and millions of pounds, it's innovate, learn, adapt, innovate, learn, adapt, definitely. So, so does that give us rise to two types of organisations, Vicky? Do we have those that get AI and are doing something and those that don't get AI and are choosing to get left behind? I think everybody 
gets AI and I think everybody gets that this is going to be a game changer. I mean, you can't, you'd have to be living under a rock, right, to, to not get that this is going to be one of the biggest, um, they're calling it the fourth industrial revolution, right? This is probably the biggest change we'll see in our lifetime. So certainly people get it, but I think combined with the technical debt that we've heard about, you know, the fact that a lot of the carriers at least have this huge legacy infrastructure in place, that, that compounded with that cultural inertia and that, that resistance to change, I think, it, 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 it does actually give people a challenge. You know, we're seeing huge technology coming out in the insurance space, but it's all in the insure tech space. And I think for, for the carriers, it's around how do you bring in that cultural change to be able to fail fast when you're constrained by the technical debt of your legacy infrastructure. It's not, it's not a, a simple question, Nigel. So let me finish on, on one thing then, talent, which comes up on every single debate. The technology is not an issue, we all know it's out there, we've got Data Robot, we've got Einstein from Salesforce, a whole host of things in a, in a Deloitte which are quite exciting from Beat to Hexcore and so much more. How do we find the right skill sets and talent? What are you doing in Salesforce and Data Robot to go and address this? Okay, so so sales. I mean, so it's been a little bit of a plug, really. But Salesforce has been voted the UK's number one place to work. Um, so we're we're lucky that we've been voted the most innovative company. You know, we are a kind of magnet for innovative people. So I think that helps us. I think insurance. We, we've talked about this before. You know, the perception of insurance is that it isn't an innovative place, which is a real shame because I think the the potential um, that we're in, the, the space in time, there's never been a more in exciting time in the insurance market. There's so much capability and potential that technology is going to enable for us. So I think for the insurers, it's, it's tapping into that and it's helping young people understand the potential and the possibility and what the opportunity is, but it's making sure they've got the right tools and, um, and culture and, and processes in place once they've got those people on board. Because if you get someone in who's looking at the potential of possibly going to a Silicon Valley type job versus going into an insurance job sounds, right. Right? yeah and then and, and they're, they're used to all of this consumer apps like Facebook and and Twitter and all of this stuff that they've had all through university and suddenly they start their professional life and they're going back to tools that are you know green screens and and, and things we haven't seen for 50 years so I think you know getting up to date treating your employees with the same respect that you would treat your customers is going to be a key first step to, to you know engaging and attracting and keeping that talent so, Vicky, thank you for that. So, Andrew, you are a former data scientist. I'm not sure you're ever a reformed data scientist. How did you get into it in the first place and why did you choose that as a career? Oh, that's a wonderful question, Nigel. I absolutely, like, I mean, give that to all the mentors that I had. Like, starting with Jim Gouja, who is right now the chief data scientist back in US for Deloitte, and uh, Sholem Feldblum back in Liberty Mutual. So, all these people are years ahead from me in the career, but they took direct responsibility to teach me insurance. So that's an important component that we have to do more and more. So young people uh, are like, you know, they're excited about technology. They're excited about bring a change to customer's life. And insurance have to focus on that part, how we can adopt open source technologies, how we can be technology first company, and how we can really give a meaning to insurance so that young people, the new generation feel excited. That's what happened to me. I kind of my last 10 years, if I really look back, uh, peop other people, senior people made insurance exciting for me. And that's why I stayed. What a great way to finish. So I uh, truly believe insurance is an exciting place to be right now. Um, data, data is at the heart of what we do. We manufacture nothing. Um, you heard it here first, guys. What happens next? See you soon in the next episode.